So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new rule is we'll start at five past, just giving people time to deal with teams. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'm just going to talk, I'm just going to spend two minutes talking about what some of the plans are for today. So um, why are we spending time on stop names? is really important. And I wanted to talk about the business rules. And I know we have found, I think it's 135 business rules. We've talked through why the business rules work or why they don't. We've got a system, we've got a technology for, for putting business rules in. We know how to do that part. We've done some tests on it. What we're struggling with, and this is what today is about, is the business rules are, are hard to implement because there's so many exceptions for them. Um, so we can't put in a business rule and say, OK, you can't put this in because it fails the business rule because everything's got exceptions. So what we wanted to start a conversation on is around names. What makes good business rules? What makes good conventions? What what are the things that that allow us to cover things off? Now, I know there's a lot of this that's covered in the schema guidance. And there's a lot of schema guidance out there and there's a lot of different guidances out there. What we've found when we look at what everyone is doing is we have 140 something ACTO codes and those everyone on those ACTO codes is dealing with slightly different constraints, slightly different realities, slightly different worlds. And what they're doing is has kind of over the last 20 something years moved in funny, weird little ways. So things should align, but sometimes they don't. Things could align nationally, but there's various little exceptions that have been taken in account locally. So that's kind of what we want to talk about today and just get an understanding of what everyone is doing to fix what the contexts are that people are working in and what sort of things people are doing with fields to, to fix them for contexts and then we can start to analyze that and come back with okay we think this is a business rule that that could apply and here's how it would look and that kind of thing because it feels like a lot of the business rules aren't really working that well um, and the one other thing that I was going to say about today is we're going to keep the audio visual stuff around the announcements and the screen printing on the buses out of scope for the moment we know that there are a constraint for a lot of people but we also know that people are taking the data and often manipulating it or putting it into a second system so we just wanted to keep that kind of out of the way for today so hopefully that makes sense to everybody and I know some people have joined late but this is all what's written on this on the mural anyway hopefully everyone's got access to the mural if you don't we're going to deal with it the same way as we always do which is when we get anything on the mural I'll get you to do it if you can't access the mural board uh, by via that bit.ly link just write it out on a piece of paper and then as as I read through stuff if your points aren't made give me a yell and I'll add them up and that seems to be the best way to move things through so I'm going to start off. There's more than 20 people. So uh, so who gets chosen to do introductions will be based on my whim and whimsy. Um, we're going to do a quick icebreaker. It's going to take us about five, 10 minutes. We're going to run through and there's going to be 20 people, maybe, maybe might, might even be 15 chosen. And I want your name. I want your pronoun. I want to know where you're from and I want to know the worst bus stop. So for example, my name is Dr. J. I use they as a pronoun. I'm from ThoughtWorks. As a, I work there as a consultant. I'm a service designer and I'm working for a department for transport. The worst bus stop is um, the one on, uh, it's on Charing Cross Road by Old Compton Street and no, Shaftesbury intersection um, opposite Harry Potter because for a lot of the time when I was catching buses from there, um, it was out of order and I'd have to walk around to find another bus stop and they were quite a distance away because of the roadworks, um, the cross viral roadworks that are happening up at Tottenham Court Road Station. More about my life than you really needed to know. So running down, Alex Spencer, you're the first one up. Your introductions, please. please. Um, yeah, I'm Alex. I'm from Transdev Bloisfield. Um, I mainly deal with uh, like trans exchange data and 
I'm part of the team that do announcements on board buses. So we do get involved in the naming of bus stops on the announcements and comparing them with what the flags are called. Uh, worst bus stop. If I say there's too many to choose from around here, <laughs> would that be that's, a good answer? That's 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 completely fine. And I missed your pronoun. Do you use he, he, uh, she or they? He. 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 Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to uh, Alison Horton. Yes, if your name begins with an A, you're far more likely to be chosen by me. Yeah, I just realised that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> to go and visit the mural. It's quite, um, it's quite soporific, actually. Um, uh, I'm Alison Horton. I'm from Surrey County Council. Uh, I won't say about my pronoun. Um, and my worst bus stop is an awful lot in Surrey that aren't yet accessible, but we're trying to improve them. But um, if actually the one outside the Albert Hall with the triple step, because I know they can't do a lot about that. So um, that sort of thing is, is not my favourite. I like that. I like that. I, I, I like that statement back. Uh, Claire Malavisi. Okay. Hi, I'm Claire Malavisi. Uh, she is a pronoun. Um, I work for Buckinghamshire County or Buckinghamshire Council in public transport team. Um, I guess one of our rural bus stops is one of our worst stops around. <laughs> excellent excellent thank you so much um dan saunders hi yes dan saunders from base up i'm a he him uh worst bus stop i don't have a worst bus stop per se but i do have something that fills me with dread every time i go to a, a large train station and it says your bus stop you to get this bus is stop e or something like that and i've spent ages going to the wrong stop and yeah that always kind of fills me with dread every time i go somewhere like that and i've got to find a <laughs> sub stop of a main stop yeah so that's that's me, basically. Thank you. Uh, Donald Henderson. Uh, hello, sorry, I've only just joined, so I'm a little bit uh, behind. Um, Don Henderson from the Highland Council, uh, just uh, looking after the bus stops in the Highland Council. Fantastic. Um, very quickly, what pronoun do you use? He, she or they? Say again, sorry? Which pronoun do you use? Do you use? prefer he she or they when i when i refer oh, he, to he he perfect and what's your worst bus stop my worst bus stop oh god uh, <laughs> <laughs> i've got quite a few <laughs> way too i love the way that worst bus stops is just way too many to talk about um uh john evans hi uh i'm john evans uh he him I'm from worcester county council um, I honestly don't have a worse bus stop. I'd say they're all brilliant. <laughs> I love your positivity. Um, I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to go for Cheryl Barnes. Hi, I'm Cheryl Barnes. I'm from Nexus, so I look after information for um, like all Tyne and Weir and Northumberland. Uh, I'd say our worst bus stop, a lot of the Northumberland ones because I don't know the area all that well, um, or Sunderland Royal Hospital, my information point with you because it's, it's, every bus stops there so we can hardly ever fit it on to the information <laughs> thanks and you use she as a pronoun just double checking I didn't do. quite catch it she, fantastic yeah. thank you uh rebecca oh peter stoner hello peter stoner you can use whatever pronoun you like for me um <laughs> and worse oh, i'm from ito world and uh, we, we do quite a lot of with the bus stops and things but um the worst bus stop, I, I, I actually remember uh, one in a magazine um, that being featured um, halfway up a, a bank with a fence uh, behind it, no pavement. Um, so the real question was, how would anybody logically use one? Yes, I, I sorry if anybody from Derbyshire is here, but I think it was actually in Derbyshire at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Those are always some of the most interesting ones. Uh, Natasha Reeves. Uh, hello, yeah, Natasha Reeves. I'm a she, um, uh, and I do RTPI and um, uh, timetables. I would say that one of the worst bus stops is called the Air Balloon on the A417 in Birdlip. Okay, I'm going to go look that one up, the Air Balloon. <laughs> just, I'm just quickly making a note. Um, 
let's go for Justin Bloom as the next person. I'm trying to switch around yep. genders as best as I can. Okay. Um, Justin Bloom, I'm from VIX Technology. Um, my pronoun is he and first bus stop probably Oakwood in London because it's famous for late arrivals. <laughs> Uh, let's go to Graham Piffer. Hi, Joe. Uh, I'm Graham. I work for Go Ahead Group, look after ticket machines and RTI and all of that sort of thing at a group level. Um, I'm a he, uh, and uh, my least favourite, I could, yeah, the bus stop I'm most ashamed of uh, is uh, the southbound bus stop on the A24 at Buck Barn Crossroads, uh, where it's on a crossroads on a dual carriageway so and it also accumulates quite a lot of water in front of it during wet weather and there's no shelter and so when it's raining you're getting uh, drenched from all sides and all angles uh, so yeah that, that'll that'll be my one for today thank you i appreciate the the, the graphic description um and i'm going to go for one last person uh who haven't i chosen oh my my memory's so bad rebecca rowe i know that i haven't chosen you I had a feeling you might pick on me. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, Rebecca Rowe, I'm the Service Information Manager at South Yorkshire PTE, um, although I live in Derbyshire. <laughs> Drop that in there. <laughs> um, no, um, so I manage a team that that uh, not only does all the, the real time, but all the registration processing, looks after NAPTAN, creates the customer information. So it's the whole service information, every last bit of it. Um, call me anything you like as long as polite and the worst bus stop um, we managed to put in a brand new bus stop in Maltby um, just as the last service that went past it uh, was withdrawn and it kind of yeah it, it, it was a bit of a you know a, 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 a feature in the local newspaper for quite some time and then we just managed to take it out as a service started going past it again. Isn't that always <laughs> the way with these things? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So we've done our icebreaker. Um, so the other thing we're going to do is when it comes to talking or everything, if you just use a little hands up thing, it'll bring you to the top and I can call on you. And that way everyone's got a clear chance to speak and we can um, manage because there's quite a few people on the call. So what I'd like you to do, uh, I've tried to set up what I believe are the different contexts that we need to use names and bus stops in. So um, I want us to focus on that first, those first three first, that urban, suburban and rural. And what I'm trying to understand is some of the ways that you're trying to describe the name of a bus stop in those different situations. Now, I know some of you might not have many urban places. Some of you might have more rural spots. So I'd like you to kind of put in um, what are the contexts? What are the things that somebody needs to be aware of that uh, happen in an urban, happen in a suburban and happen in a rural context? Just to kind of help me understand the richness. Now, I'm based in London. I don't travel very much, uh, especially at the moment, um, on public transport outside of London. So I literally don't know what bus stops really look like that much outside of London. So I'm needing you to kind of give me that richness of information of telling me um, how you, how, for example, on a rural road that's just one long straight road that's called that, the B something or other, how do you name the five bus stops down that road? What are the things that you that you would do to allow somebody to understand which of the bus stops they're at? So um, I'm going to give us a couple of minutes. Does everyone does anyone have any questions about what we're trying to do? Just giving ourselves that context of what we're what we're thinking of for bus stops. Um, and if everyone can use mural, um, we'll just give us five minutes. Um, there's sticky notes that, that that you can grab and just stick them next to those various um, urban, suburban, and and rural, just to kind of say what's what's different about those contexts. Right. So do feel free to leave comments and things like that. I will sometimes pull them across into sticky notes if I need to. Um, so what I'm going to do is just quickly read through the stuff around the urban environment 
and then we'll move on to the suburban and down to the rural. So on an urban environment, stop letters are good for locals, but more confusing for visitors. Business names are best, but tend to change. Tend to have bus stations and naming conventions are different from regular stops or suburban stops. So is this like there's a big central bus station and it's got um, big central bus station, Bay A, Bay B, Bay C, Bay D. Is that what that is talking that's about? That's right. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was meaning. Yeah. So Fantastic. I, think, uh, I think urban areas tend to have more bus stations compared to suburban areas. So the convention could be slightly different. Yeah. Fantastic. That's 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 really useful. Naming after a commercial premises is never a good idea. Um, really depends on the area and a large town city centres, for example, I find it easy when a stop is defined by street name landmark, e.g. stopping, stopping centre and a stop marker, e.g. 1A. So this would be like a uh, shopping centre bus stop A and there's another bus stop on the other side of the shopping centre that's called shopping centre bus stop B. Is that what you're, is that what this is kind of saying? Uh, exactly, yeah. So, uh, for example, in Chesterfield, there's New Beatwell Street and you've got stops, um, I can't remember if it's numbered or lettered now, but uh, uh, you know the street name and you know exactly which stop to go for. That's that's really useful. Um, we use stop identifiers at larger interchanges like city centre bus stations with maps showing where they are. Um, I think in London they're called spider maps. Is that the ones that you're talking about? So you can see the road and you can see if I'm a, if I'm standing at, at bus stop A and I want bus stop Z, I go along and around the corner and there's bus stop Z even though it's because it's within the same area. Is that the sort of thing that we're just talking about? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. No, no worries. Just making sure that I've understood all of these. Um, need to be aware that landmarks can change, e.g. pub names. Side roads might be a better bit in many cases, but in urban areas, you at least have a choice of options. Um, often very specific landmarks, but also side roads, much choice. Um, I'm just trying to read this one from Tricia, but Tricia's editing it, so I'll grab another one first. Multiple stops in one location, e.g. bus stations, but also events venues, hyperlocal networks, e.g. Stratford, where the, sh where the shopping centre is a locality in and of itself. Because there's multiple bus stops within the shopping centre and you can use the buses to get around the shopping centre if you really want to. Is that what it's saying or is this very much that, that idea of there's a shopping centre with a bus stop A and a bus stop B and maybe a bus stop C around it? Okay, I'll go to Trisha's one. Trying to find a landmark that is unlikely to change. We do avoid pub names as these often change, but do use them as a last resort. If no landmark, we use the nearest side roads. Landmarks are schools, churches, libraries, post offices, hospitals, GP surgeries, memorials, supermarkets, etc. Um, side road, school, university, shopping centre, uh, side road stop letters used an indicator, not common name. Landmarks such as museums, galleries and libraries. Um, I think this is for the urban ones. When on foot, needle in a haystack, you can see many stops, which is the right one, needs details, detailed differentiation, e.g. stop A, Exeter Street, David's Station. So this is saying I'm at a bus station and I need to be on this street and there'll be multiple stops and I need stop A of those multiple stops. Gotcha. When on the bus, need to, load, need, to need a landmark to know when to get off, e.g., not e.g. stop A, but Exeter St David Station. Uh, so it's telling me not just that I need to get off at stop A because there might be multiple stop A's and I don't know which of the stop A's I want to get off at. I need to get off at the landmark stop A or the landmark and the landmark's what I'm more interested in when I'm on the bus. So there's a slightly different context there. Um, is there anything else on the, the urban areas that we need to consider? And ah, here we are. Ideally, should be a recognised landmark, particularly places that passengers may may wish to visit, e.g., supermarket. Is there anything else on the urban areas before I move on to looking at the suburban areas, which are a little bit of a different space? And I've tried to draw as a whole pile of houses that look the same. 
Uh, let me just get this comment. Which I will add up there as well. So the first one is struggle when we have a large number of residential only road with no side roads. Don't really like using house numbers. So we've got a large, a long road and there's no landmarks. It's just lots of houses and the two or three bus stops along there need to be differentiated because calling them residential road isn't going to be really useful, but you're having to put them like opposite this place or opposite this number. Is that yeah. what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah. And um, we've, we've used like middle of the road as um, to try and differentiate it, but it's not, not great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I can understand that that would, that would make it really, really tricky. Um, side road, church, pub, house number, e.g. opposite um, 38, difficulty in using side roads, um, need to ensure stop names. Oh, just say, I think that's an urban one. A stop names is not repeated, causes confusion, which Hamilton Road, Road Stand B, do you mean? Yep. All stops are named using local area, main road, side road. Side road is normally the next available on the left. If on a long road, we look for useful, stable landmarks. Some urban locations may have additional stop references where services are allocated, so don't serve all stops at passes. So is this, for example, um, Nicholas, and I'll come to you in two seconds. Is this, for example, along residential road, if it stopped at one end and the other but not at middle you would need to kind of differentiate between residential road so that it was clear that this service would sail past middle stop and somebody would be very clear about that yeah i mean it, it's it's more a it, it's it's not particularly a comment for any particular one of these sort of urban or anything it's it's sort of a for everything we have one kind of way of approaching it but when you come to either sort of large local areas or city centres where, like I say, a, a bus will pass loads of stops, but it won't serve them all. They'll generally have a, an additional reference. So a customer knows specifically from mapping, et cetera, which one to actually go to. That's that's great. That makes sense. And I think we'll come to a little bit of that as one of the other contexts. Nicholas. Hello. Um yeah, there's, there's a, just a couple of small things that actually with other people's comments that's just made me realise as well is that um, we have um, services that serve estates where basically all of the roads in the estate have the same name. So you'd have a road saying the avenue goes all the way around the estate and you have lots of little branch cul-de-sacs, but they're all, they don't have a separate name they've all got this they're all basically branches of the same parent so again you, you don't have anything to name a stop after because it's basically the same as the road you're on which technically doesn't meet the the, the dft's naming schema that that yeah so it's like what do you call the, the bus stop because all the roads have basically got the same name um <laughs> There was yeah, else no, I, I get completely forgotten it now as well. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. Moment, you can I'll raise your back. hand to come back. Yes, you can raise well your hand done. to come back. Thank you. But I think I think that's a really good one that I that I hadn't considered is that estate roads can sometimes have that. And I'm assuming you're not talking the sort of estate that has large blocks with names on it. You're talking a much more uh, single single. Um, one or two story estate, not large tower block estates. Exactly. Yeah. So if, I think in in effect, the little branches, the cul-de-sac branches, I suppose act as a kind of service road, service link. So it just it allows the estate to sort of, well, allows the developers to fit more houses around the estate uh, by having these little service branches. But like I said, they're all named after the parent road. Um, and I have remembered the other point was was uh, someone mentioned about calling it mid, top, bottom. I mean, it's something we use, but it's one that I particularly don't like because um, one person's top could be another person's bottom, depending on which end of the road that they're on. Um, mm -hmm. And I find that if you're not familiar with the area and you're just looking at, on the, or looking at it on the map, 
what's the top end and what's the bottom. It makes sense if the road's on a hill, but if it's flat, you, it can cause a bit of confusion. Mm -hmm. I got you with that one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. that's really good. Alison, you've got a comment to make. Only to say that uh, I agree with Nicholas. I think on one of our roads, we have a road with a similar development with a road all called the same. Um, and we've gone with west, south, north, etc. Well, that does, does rely on people knowing their bearings. And I'm not sure that exactly fits either. It's it's a really tricky one. That is that is a really tricky one. And that's these are some of the really tricky things that I want us to be aware of when we create the strategy of how we use the fields. Um, so side road, church, pub, house number. Oh, OK, I did that, did that. Difficult to name. If a side road or feature isn't available as DFT doesn't allow schema naming after the road that it's on, that's what I'm questioning because some of the rules don't make sense in reality. So it's, we can't really change reality, so let's change the rules. Um, bus stops should have the same name for both directions. If you're like from a bus stop called X, you should normally be able to catch a bus back to where you came from, from a stop called X, and this will usually be on the opposite side of the road. I think that's brilliant. I know that there are some one-way roads where this stuff might not happen, but I like this as a principle. I think that's really good. Uh, using business names or landmarks, and they may need to revisit the naming convention periodically to check they're still valid. That's all that we seem to have on Suburban. Is there anything else on Suburban that anyone on those suburban areas, any other parts of that context that we really need to get our heads into. Fantastic. So let's move on to urban, uh, rural. Um, I've tried to represent this as just the road which has a stop on. And I know that some of these could be hail and ride, some of these could be custom. There might not be a pole there. So those are some of the other questions I'm going to ask later. Right. We need obvious landmarks. Farm, pub, quarry, nearest landmark, outside opposite house. Routes which have several stops simply called bus shelter. As a lot of villages no longer have features like pubs or shops, they have to be named after a property, old post office is common, or something generic such as finger post. I'm going to ask what a finger post is in a second. Post box or telephone box if one exists. Away from villages, road have Roads have no names, so need to be named after properties, especially farms. Junctions with names are useful, but many minor junctions on back lanes don't have a name because everything a name becomes difficult to name after anything. Junction or crossroads becomes the default, even if they are vague because an area has several. Right. Can I? The, my one question is, I don't know what a finger post is. Sorry, that 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 was me, uh, Dr. J. Um... It's basically an, an old signpost uh, with uh, basically the, the the little signs are shaped as fingers, little arrows. So it's a, it's an old an old style um, signpost that you tend to find on junctions in in rural areas. Gotcha, gotcha. So they're the ones that say London, London, two hundred and fifty miles. Thank you. Exactly, exactly yeah, what that, I needed to see. Yeah, the picture there. That's exactly it. I'm just going to add a comment and write finger post so that I remember what that is. Perfect. Um, a stop names needs to be descriptive as possible to allow visitors and locals to find the stop without confusion. That's a really great ideal. Uh, churches and pubs, although generally avoid business names and the classic red post or black post. I'm not even going to. I'm sure that actually allows people to define a stop. Um, should be defined with nearby obvious landmarks that aren't likely to change. I've often visited a bus stop named after a pub that no longer exists. And sadly, thanks to the, the world, there are many that no longer exist. Needs a landmark is often no side roads. Places that serve by courtesy that are not formal stops, e.g. individual houses or minor access roads. So are these ones that are named like um, Harrison Farm, so if you know where Harrison Farm is, you know where the stop is. If you don't know where Harrison Farm is, it's just a stop randomly along this road that's suddenly called Harrison Farm. Is that what we're talking about there with those um, courtesy stop type ones?
Okay. Farms, walkways, any other buildings available as a, as a landmark, access to walking routes, paths and access to landmarks off-road, farms, pubs and post offices, farms, pubs, side roads, tracks, often building, building on rural roads have house names, so use those too, have used the road name and northbound, etc., where there is nothing else, junction or house name. Many rural bus stops are not marked with a flag and precise description landmarks are not always present. Uh, when on foot, very few stops, so a landmark of place name plus direction is sufficient, e.g. Sadler's Arm, Limpston, northbound. When on a bus and need to know where to get off, landmark or place name, e.g. Sadler, Sadler's Arms, Limpston. Uh, cool. Yeah, Dr. J, is it, oh, I've just had a little bit more context to that one, just for a second. Yeah. So Dave from uh, Transport API. Yeah, I think um, just a, another thought about another dimension to this in terms of uh, context. There's clearly the, the context which we need to think about, which goes from urban, uh, suburban and rural. But I think the context of the user is important as well um, uh, as to whether they might be on foot trying to do something or on the bus trying to do something else or planning a trip trying to do yet yeah, uh, something else again um, and that's just I suppose some of the things I've been thinking about here in terms of the the stop name might need to vary in those things, situations and that the, I put the two examples for urban and rural about that you know if you're on foot looking for a stop you really need to find that stop the one going in the right direction with some differentiator but if you're on the bus you don't care that the, the stop you're getting off is northbound or southbound what you care about is making sure you get off at the right one so I think um, that's just one of the things in terms of getting the stop names right in different contexts that I think is useful. Um, I could also think, and I think it's less relevant about the context of the, almost the, the medium by which they're accessing information. For instance, there might be no artifact at all. It's verbally, they've been told the stop name and they're going there. Or um, it might be a paper artifact or it might be digital. And I'm not sure there's that much difference in the, in the context of the medium, but I do think the, almost the task that the user is trying to achieve and the context they're in, whether it's on foot or on the bus, is probably a relevant one to think about. I think that's brilliant. And I've, that's why I was very quickly adding one more person context that I could, that I kind of wanted to bring in, um, which, Tim, I'll take that little thing that you put on there and just move it across over to here. Um, I've just created a third a third one. So we've got a oh, fourth one. So we've got four user context that I wanted us to just quickly think about. I'm going to give you like two minutes to go and throw some stickies up above these things. Mobile, during the journey, on the journey, before the journey. The user using it on the web before the journey. The physical when you're at a bus stop during the journey and you see a timetable or you're looking at a physical timetable and then on a bus with the next bus displays. Now, I know that I said the AVs are out, but I think this might be one of those ones where I'll bring it in because I think it is going to play. Oh, I got that fly. Um, it is going to play into uh, into some of this discussion. So I'm going to give you two minutes. Just have a think about what might be different between these contexts and what are things that are really important for us to think about when we're throwing this around and around these contexts. So I'm just going to give us two minutes on the timer. And just throw up things that you think are slightly different between them. I also have to say that I'm loving the way everyone is really focused on making these journeys as best as possible for the users. And that's something that I just wanted to say, and I just thought I'd very quickly say that I'm really enjoying about this group is that you're focused on what makes it good for the people using the buses. And that user focus is really, really lovely to see. Just thought I'd all offer you a nice compliment there while we have a second left. Right, I'm going to start off with the mobile during the journey and I'll work my way through. Um, so, constraint on length of bus stop name. Detail should not be too long continuing the space viewing from. Generally, less space to describe on a mobile device, small screen. Need to recognize stop to a light, e.g. landmark. Text messages, yes, some people do still use them. Very limited text length. Um, how will I know where I am in the dark? Village and other context important. People don't just travel in daylight. Distinguishing between what stops I am near when I'm attempting to find my stop. As transport professionals, we probably want to be exact and passengers come from, from a different point as users. 
use short name fields for text limited displays. Is there anything else around the mobile during the journey? Um, and I do appreciate that some people do still use text messages. Um, is there anything else that we need to be aware of there? Fab, I'm going to move on. So the web before the journey, able to have long names and additional context. Identify correct boarding point may have longer time to find it. Diversions may only show on website. Um, is there anything? Oh, and there's informative guide, informative to guide passenger to stop. I have to say, as a disabled traveller, one of the other things that I like to do on the web before journey is sometimes physically see what the stop looks like because it helps me know that it reassures me that I'll recognise it. Does that make sense? Because sometimes um, just being able to see the stop or see what's around the stop means that when I see something, I'm like, yeah, that's going to make me feel like, oh, I know what the stop is. Um, I use a lot of Google Google views for that. Um, on the timetable, so this is on the post, the little timetable, needs to be clear from bus and descriptive. Still needs locality at bus stop because user might not know where they are. In rural areas, physical stop may not exist, so there'll be no timetable present or could be away from stop, e.g. on parish notice board. Limited size of stop plates. Stop plates are the things that tell you what a stop is. They're the, the little flaggy bits, or is a stop plate the pieces that you stick the timetables onto? It's the flag at the top. Fantastic. I didn't really, I hadn't realised that yet. Um, display space may be limited for some displays and able to show full stop name. So you, there's a limited font size to make them still readable and the more you're trying to fit on there the less and less readable it gets. Um, I think consistency is key for the customers to be able to match the information they have sourced online on a timetable or journey planner etc and actually find it on street and vice versa so they can relate to the stop on the street when they're searching online or planning a journey. I think that's fab and that's what we're going to come to in our when it goes wrong example because um, I think that's one of the things that that shows up there. Um, so let's have a look on the bus. So this is some of the little bits around being on the bus. So the next bus stop displays, so the alerts and things that I get when I'm traveling, just to let me know where I am and I can plan my journey. Important, it matches with the names used elsewhere, e.g. at stop, websites, etc. On bus need to differentiate between the stops on the journey, usually more detailed than locality, but not as detailed as northbound or stop A. On bus systems will have added locality info, nearby, nearby points of interest. These displays are dynamic, so the operator may find it useful to define something more exact, e.g. shop names, pub names, etc. Next stop could be a hail and ride area. So announcement could be made, passenger rings a bell, but the bus stops a long distance from the, from the location could be reliant on driver's local knowledge. You short, um, just running back to this hail and ride. So this is like, there's like a mile of hail and ride section and I ring the bell and I, I don't quite know where I want to, I kind of know where I want to stop on there, but the bus driver might stop somewhere that's different to what I expect. Yes, yeah. That, that's oh, it's Nicholas. Yeah, that, that's what's getting at. Because sometimes a stop could be in between villages and there may be just one arbitrary hail and ride point uh, that is at a farm, but there could be a lay-by halfway down, there could be a lay-by three quarters of the way along with a cottage next to it. But if the passenger doesn't know exactly where it is, and they hear the stop name, knowing, knowing that actually I need that stop, and the announcement's made as soon as the bus has passed the previous stop, they might ping the bell and the driver then say, uh, where do you need? Because the, the, the passenger might think, oh, it'll just stop next to yeah. Harrison Farm, to use your example from earlier, 
Whereas it could be that they want to go, or the, the driver may end up pulling outside, you know, the old vicarage or something like that. Yeah, I yeah, it's kind of like this. The Highland Road section covers multiple places, and you've got to know as a passenger to tell the bus driver which of those multiple places you want, or they'll just take a wild guess as to where you might be going. Yes, because it could be that the hail and ride section could literally, on some registrations, it could be that hail and ride might apply as a default once you've left the 20 or 30 mile an hour area. So as soon as you head on onto a national speed limit road with a, um, that's you know five miles long, ruler straight road, but it's only got the one point, the driver might say, oh, how far down do you need? Because they could, re could realise that actually... The, the stop is Harrison Farm, but but the passenger might want Harrison Farm because it's the closest place, or they might not realise, but the driver could just pull up you know, 50 metres down from where the bell's been pinged mm. because they might think that that's where the passenger wants the bus to pull in. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, and that's a really interesting almost that's a really interesting little rural one to to kind of figure out um so thank you for that uh alison you've got a you've got your hand up just on what uh i think it was uh, nicholas just said is that the driver will only be able to stop where they think it's safe to stop as well whereas that i mean it's more passenger education isn't it but you may have a name of a stop but the driver not be able, may be able to stop there actually because it's not safe for them to do so mm. totally get that um mark You've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say about the uh, hail and ride bit in the schema. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be calling a hail and ride after a single point of stop, uh, like a cottage or a farm or something. Uh, the hail and ride should be the name of a road that it's on. And then you, in the Naptan schema, you, you have your start and end points that define that period of that area. If you're naming, if you only have a a one single stop, maybe outside a farm where a bus can stop, and that's the only place that bus can stop on that whole section of road, we'd use that as a custom stop and not a hail and ride stop. I think that's a good convention, and I think uh, I'm going to try to summarise that and put that up against the rural point of there's a difference between a hail and ride section and a uh, and a stop, but sometimes they're difficult in the stop names if it's just a very, if the entire space between two villages is just a, is a hail and ride section um, that is difficult to name because it's in the middle of, of a couple of villages. Um, but I think that's, you, you make a really good point there. Let me just try and note that down. Aha, uh -huh, stops shouldn't have names should be more like ha area not har harrison farm i'll just use harrison farm as an example does that make um does that note kind of summarize it, it's trying to summarize it for my brain so yeah that, that's just from what i've been going through renaming all our hail and ride areas and our following the current nap time scheme yeah, yeah. And I think this is part of just trying to get some of these little conventions and sort out how we can help you identify them and how we can set up rules so that we can flag up so that we don't have 99% of the stops having exceptions on them. Uh, where did we get to? Next stop, Hail and Ride, Short Text Limited Fields. On the bus systems have added locality. I think I've covered, oh, be aware of stop names with local pronunciations or spellings. Embarrassing moment. I took TFL's bus lady to t teach me that it was Southwark, not not Southwark, because I used to talk about Southwark Station until somebody pointed out that it's actually pronounced Southwark, because that's what the nice lady on the buses said. Um, you you do actually need that a lot because there's slightly different pronunciations in different places as well, and it's really difficult if you don't know the local things to know exactly what it's called. And it does change within the UK as well. Um, apparently, Bermondsey can be pronounced as Bermondsey, um, and Bermondsey is a Scottish way of saying the same word. So there's a couple of different ways. It's not just 
poor Kiwis who get things wrong. Anything else on context that we need to know? Now I'm gonna, I'm aware of time, we've got an hour left and I want to take us through two big things. So I'm gonna leave constraints out for the moment. And if you wanna come back and put in constraints later, that would be amazing, but we're just gonna skip over that for now. Cause I think in what you've said, you've covered a lot of the different constraints as to what's there. So this is going to be a can of worms and many other things. I've put out all of the fields that are to do with names. We've got actor code, naptan code, and plate code. Now I know actor code and naptan code are the main names and they never vary and they're always unique. Plate code is something slightly different and clear down code, I don't think anyone ever uses. And then we've got common name, short common name, landmark, street, crossing, indicator, locality name, parent locality name, grandparent locality name, town and suburb. Now, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes, I'm gonna give you like five minutes, just to go through and put down what is the really important thing that you try to say with that name. And I know that it's going to, I know that there's something in the schema that tells us what these names are, but I'm also aware that these things vary ever so slightly between regions and also have varied slightly as to whether you're working mostly with urban or mostly with rural stops. So grab a sticky and put next to it, what is what you're trying to describe with that name, whether you use it. If you don't use it, just go, I do not use this. This is not relevant to me. This doesn't make sense because I'm just trying to figure out how some of these are being used in slightly different ways. So I'm gonna give us five minutes um, seeing the length of this list and all the names gave me a good laugh. Yes, yes, it's it's one of those things because um, one of the problems that we've got is we've got to try and create rules that make sense across all these names that if this name is used for this, then the same information can't be in this other name or you can't have conflicting information in another name. Or those are some of the rules that exist currently that everyone puts exceptions on. So I'm just trying to find the right kind of rules that we should have here. Um, yes, uh, don't worry too much about Acto code and Naptan code. I know that they're unique stops and they're beautiful identifiers. It, that's more just a test that everyone knew that. Everything else is all the names and short names are the things that I need to understand. Oh yes, um, the National Gazetteer, also known as Nubtig, because uh, of course we wanted a really sexy name. Um, just trying to understand, um, I'm gonna ask a contentious question and feel free to put an answer up or not, or just ponder this in the background. If that didn't exist, if Nubtig didn't exist, would people still be able to find places using the localities on maps or is the localities on maps in that gazetteer too different from what we use in Nubtig? I'm merely asking that question. I'm not suggesting we destroy Nubtig or anything like that. I'm just trying to understand why we have, a, why Nubtig exists when there are other gazetteers. Alison, I'm pleased I made you laugh. Um, I'm just needing a reminder of where you're from. Not not that that's a bad thing of just saying, um, I'd love to chat to you later. I just need to remember to make myself a note. Uh, I'm from Surrey County Council. Oh, great. Um, I'm if, so if there. If any help, actually, uh, Dr. J, I, um, uh, we use Kent County Council to do most of our nap time. So um, they do a lot of our data management. I think they do it for some other uh, local authorities as well. So we tend to give them a very briefish note and then the experts there, uh, Roger Court and Melanie Dolan, who I don't think are on this uh, webinar, um, do a lot of our work for us due to lack of resource. Great. And uh, that's the sort of thing that we're covering off, that kind of relationship is what we're covering off and what we're calling responsible, although we might rename it, responsible and agent when it comes to the two different roles that people can have towards NAPTAN stops. Right. I never like to think responsible at all. 
I know, I know. And we've discovered responsible is possibly not the right word to use. We just need to find a word um, for that layer of person or that hat that somebody is wearing. Right, taking a deep breath, diving on into the fields. We'll see, we'll see how we go. I'm gonna give us about 20 minutes to get through this and then we'll crack on with the next one. So I've got a couple of quick questions. This one, we use a code made up of county, district, parish. Can somebody talk me through this one? Uh, done by visiting something. Yeah, it's Mark from Cumbria. Yeah, we, we've, our codes start off with our Cumbria number, and then there's, uh, I think, two digits for the districts and two digits for the parish, and then there's a, a four digit on the end of it. And I, I assumed when we started, everyone did it the same way. And I looked at the, um, all the neighbouring authorities, and everyone seems to do things differently. Some people put lattice in there, some people put uh, different codes in, so I think it, it there obviously isn't, isn't one standard way of, of designing an ACCO code. Right, so you um, up of a pattern, okay. Yeah. Because I think that is also really interesting that, that you're adding extra data to your ACTO codes. Um, some, some local authorities have third parties to create the NAPTAN data and they may not have the local knowledge. I think that's also really good. Essential, uh, essential to link to TNDS, et cetera. Um, internal use only, not for the public but I love that somebody else puts this on bus stop flags, so this helps people reporting damage at stops. It's a unique stop identifier, but we have two of them, but that's an entire different thing. Unique numbering, most reliable machine readable unique ID for a stop. But somebody said that they never use it. Could the, Lynn, could you explain to me how you use NAPTAN without using ACTO codes? Sorry, I think that's a mistake. I shouldn't have put that. <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. I was, I was, uh, I will just quietly make that go away. Um, that was the thing that was confusing me because I was like, this is the the big thing that holds everything together. How could we not use it? Or is that somebody not understanding it? That's totally okay. Naptan code, which is also like Apto code, um, for use by the public, though really used. Public facing ID, but not always present. Acto code is the main identifier, but that then code is used for SMS confusing names. Got that. Is there, um, and somebody's just putting a note. We have this code on SMS plates, yes. And I know that some people use it for the QR code to go, it's used on, for some QR codes to go and get the data for a stop for like the next bus and that. but. There are some other QR codes that use a different code, and I'm just trying to understand that. Plate code, used for identifying and maintaining individual stops. I think initially intended to host local authorities' internal asset codes to align with the asset management system, but as with clear-down code, apparently redundant. Actually could have some use to, oh, sorry, I'm just having to make this bigger, some use to unwind the location of the asset and asset management systems for the stop location transport purposes. Can somebody help me understand that one? I'm just trying to just Hi, make Jane. sure that I've got it. Yeah, um, so local authorities who, who manage um, stop locations in NAPTAM may have the, the asset, so you know this actual stuff that they own has a, a, a place which they need to send people to when they're fixing or maintaining it. And, and, and that is sometimes slash often different from where you as a passenger might expect the stop to be. And, and we're talking about a difference of, of uh, centimetres or metres. Mm. But in some locations, I must stress it's very, very few, there is actually some distance between the asset. And I think plate code was initially designed so that if you had if you had a system which looked after where all of your assets were, then a bus stop would have a code from that system which might live in the plate code. Right, right, I've got you. So plate code is more, so plate code, from what I'm seeing from most people, this is a little bit more the asset code from my asset management system is being called plate code. Is there anyone on this call who's using plate code? Don't worry, I'm not about to destroy it or get, or get rid of it. Um, I'm just trying, because I can see there's some 
places use it. I'm just trying to understand how how people use it. <clears throat> the wording smacks to me a little that it might be a TFL driven field, but happy to be told otherwise. Trisha. Trisha Hi. White. Um, Hi. We never used the plate code until about a year ago um, when our one of our operators, Nottingham City Transport, needed it needed the field to create something in their electronic systems. So I don't know what they use it for, but I've had to put it in. Can I, I'm just going to make a note to get in contact with you to understand mm -hmm. what they're doing with it, because that's kind of mm -hmm. using something f for not the purpose what is, is intended. And um, when we're trying to disambiguate some of the stuff, it's just trying to understand what it's there for. Yeah, I'll, um, right, I'll make like a hope. note to email Nottingham City Transport and ask what they actually use it for as well. I just did it because they asked for it. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Cheryl, you've got a question. You've got your hand up. Hi, uh, we use plate code in our system, um, but as far as I know, it's so that the, the actual shortened ACO code number goes up onto the bus stop flag when we change the flags over on the street. Uh, so this is so you're using plate code as a short version of the ACTO code so that somebody who calls you up and says this post has been run into by by another car, you would know which one it is because it's they're able to refer to the right place. Yes. Uh, yeah. OK. And this code. OK, cool. That's good to know. Clear down code. I'm just going to quickly say I'm aware from a previous meeting that that the technology that clear down code field was created for has since in the intervening 20 years has peaked, become completely redundant, and now this field is, should be totally redundant. Um, and I just want to check if, if anyone is still using it. Not used because there's no longer a need for a, a separate shared internal code between two systems. Real-time systems used to reference the stop for direct run is clear down of stop-based displays, probably no longer used. Don't know what it is, not used. Limited use for local clear down, not many existing instances of local clear down now. Does anyone still use local clear down? I'd, I'd, we have, no to, I'd have to check that. Um, I'm not sure. I think we might have a few instances of local clear down still in our system. We know that there's only about there's less than I think there's definitely less than a hundred uh, clear down codes still filled out in in the Nash, NAPTAN national stops of active stops. Yeah, so it, it'd um, only it'd only be one one of one service or so I should imagine if any, but quite possibly yeah. be none by now. It would be good just to double check because it, if we can get rid of it, we might. <laughs> Common name. Common name. Now this is where the, the can of worms opens. OK, let's find out how we're seeing common name. Also used on bus stop flags. This is usually landmark, side road, bay, stop number, etc. Most important needs to be clear to passengers despite what the schema says. Common name should not include the locality name to avoid duplication. Primary name used to identify the stop to third parties. Needs to be relevant, not historic needs to be something clear. Uh, concatenation of street and crossing our main side roads, main road slash side road. Apparently that creates problems. I'm going to come, Natasha, I'll be there in a second. Used on play and roadside publicity identifies a stop for public. Closest field to what a user would call the stop. Natasha. Uh, I can see your hands up. I think you might still be on mute. Sorry, I don't agree with um, the common name not being the same as the um, uh, the the town name because it that's all that might be available. So um, uh, the rule is at the moment that you can't use that, but it's it's it it gets ever so complicated when that's all you've got to play with. So I'd like to just highlight that. I don't know if anybody agrees with that. Um, I think that's a good point. One of the other ones that I, there's an issue with this one when we apply the rules, 
because you're not allowed to have two street names. And I know that because one of the bus stops that I use is called Tottenham Court Road, Great Russell Street, because that's the name of the street. That's the name of the stop that I hop off at. And yet that is flagged as a, as a flaw in some of the business rules because it uses two, it, it refers to a crossing and, and uses two instances. So this is where that main road, side road problem crops up um, with some of the rules that are implemented currently. So I just kind of wanted to say that this also flags up against a problem. Does anyone else have that same problem when they're trying to describe a crossroads as this road and this road or this road and this street? I mean, for this one, um, like I said, I mean, our, our naming convention is main road, side road. Um, and the we recently did this concatenation because um, most developers use common name um, to name the, the, the road in like journey planning data, et cetera. And we had a problem where it was mainly shown as the side road, so the, the crossing was basically what was in the common name field. So for instance, the problem we found in our new journey planner was that if somebody wanted to actually journey plan from Aberdale Road South, knowing there are about 12 bus stops on that road, actually what came up was the two side roads, the two bus stops that had a side road of Aberdale Road South and not the 12 that were actually on that road. So to make sure that customers could actually consistently check the names that were actually physically out on stops and were shown in other bits of customer facing information. Um, but also, I want to travel from a bus stop on this road. So they should be able to type it in. And then when it's a long road, be able to differentiate which stop it actually is from whatever you're using, like say if it's side road or a landmark or whatever. It's just the majority of our things are side road because that's how our naming convention works. Thank you. That that's 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 really useful. Um, Mark and then Nicholas. So Mark. Hi, yeah. Um, if developers are only using the common name to list the stops, then isn't that the developer's problem in not using the full NAPTAM uh, benefits? Because as in the schema, it your common name should be a reference to the main road and using the indicator to reference it, how it relates to the main road. Uh, uh, Mark, I we, think this is a, I think this is an education problem that I also want to tackle, but I understand that some of the conventions are difficult to apply glo uh, nationally and some developers have made calls in the way that they've used the data that might not be the smartest way because trying to interpret where they're going hasn't been that clear. Does that make kind of we, sense? We used to have all our common names as main road slash side road to list all our stops and we had a request from DFT and it took us two years to clear all that to just get rid of the main road out of our common name. I'm very sorry about that, and I'm sorry that 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 was a, uh, a a decision that was made to clear something up that that might have actually created more problems than people anticipated. Nicholas, hello. Oh, I, uh, this I've got two scenarios where sometimes the use of the main road with the side road may be useful. Although we do in in our data tend to avoid it and follow what our local authority partners have have, have said, but they can be um, firstly if the same side road is met by two different roads that the same bus service goes down, maybe it loops again round an estate or something like that, and then a side road bisects across it. Uh, so sometimes you may want to use the, the, the main road to distinguish which end of the side road they're at. And secondly, you ha we have scenarios where uh, a bus may a bus route may serve a stop that is called you know, Bridge Road or something like that, and then it turns into that road. 
and then you've got a number of stops with bridge roads, side roads. So sometimes having the the stop named after the road that the bus is about to turn into can be confusing. Yeah. Okay. Stop named after road can be good. Um, I've tried to summarize that. I know that I haven't done a good job of it, but I know that this is recorded so I can go back and I'll just go listen to the recording to decipher. Um, and that's at about 3.15. Sorry, just making a note for myself there. Um, I think, uh, David, sorry, you've got a, a, a point and then uh, I'll yeah. move on to short common name. Yeah, um, actually, mine kind of spans between um, common name and indicator. Um, I think the data producer knows the name that they want the end user to see and probably in different contexts as well. Um, they know that they've got a convention of where they are with um, main road, side road or landmark or anything else that really works where they are and, and they're kind of best suited to say what that is. Um, they provide the elements of that in the structure that NAPTAN allows. And then there is application logic and business logic to be able to allow people to recreate those names. Um, for instance, if the indicator is something, put this name together in a certain way. And I think that might be where the problem is. Um, I did some analysis on this and there were, I won't give the exact number, there were 14,000 different values for indicator. If there were 12, we could do something with it. If there were 50, we might be able to do something with it. But when there's 14,000, you can't have 14,000 different um, if or if else clauses to be able to say, if, if the indicator's this, do this, if it's this, do this. And I think that's the thing that really limits um, the data set at the moment. Um, and, and that's kind of what's problematic with some of these names. I also did analysis on about five different um, bus of different services, transport services and some stops, and they all came up with different names. Um, and if you look at how they were, they were just putting together these fields in different ways. Um, so I think that's the bit that almost needs tightening up. And I could see, and I don't, not, I don't want to, you know, if, however it's tightened up, whether it's tightened up through being much more specific in the data producer controlling those names, or whether it's solved through being much more prescriptive in the business logic and what the allowed fields are. I really, I think people don't mind, but there's a, there is a kind of break in this data set in between the intention of what the data producer wants the name to be and what can be retrieved from it. Um, and try as we might with so many different approaches to it, we'll find something that works somewhere else, but like a whack-a-mole whack style, it, it breaks in another location. And yeah. I Thank you. And I think um, I've made a note because I am I, I will set aside some time and become totally geekly nerdly on names with you at some point. Um, and this is part of what I'm starting to tackle and what we're just trying to tackle very lightly. So instead of trying to do what everyone feels like has happened before, if lots and lots of whack-a-moles running at the same time, it's like, let's let's find out what makes sense and let's assume that everyone has the best intentions and just try and corral things as close as possible so we can get the most out of this data because that's our goal everyone has the goal here of making this as usable as possible for an end user does that make sense to everybody and i'm going to move on to short common name <coughs> not always populated and sometimes it's longer than common name yes don't use. Use for displays on streets such as LED, dis LED displays that have limited space. Think this is used on our LED displays, limited character length. Don't currently use it. Short name for RTPI displays, which I'm assuming are those scrolling LED ones, and don't use. Fantastic. Landmark. Same as common name. We only fill this out if it is a genuine landmark. Wouldn't use it if the common name was the nearest side road. Helps us identify a stop in a familiar area. Don't use, I'd expect this to be part of the common name if important. Use for identifying tourist buildings, e.g. town hall. Difficult to judge, best to use. If this were used and currently, if this were used currently in public facing interfaces, would probably use, but currently I don't. That's really good to know and kind of understand about landmark. Moving on to street. Street that the bus stop is located on. 
used to identify the actual street road you're on. Don't use, I expect this to be part of the common name if important. Can be difficult when rural roads have none. Need to be careful with long roads, and I know that long roads change names and places. Anything else? Any thoughts on street? Moving on to crossing. Don't use, don't use, don't use. I expect this to be part of common name if important. Nearest side road, not relevant. Don't use, no idea what this is. Used to indicate the nearest intersecting road from the stop with preference for the left hand side road if it is a choice, not widely used. Uh, started using. Where the common name is a landmark or anything not side road. OK, that makes sense. Indicator. Gives user more information on the local on the location of stop used to reference the common name E I E Bay A adjacent opposite other side uh, outside needed for which side of the road can be difficult in areas with multiple stops used on the plate flag to indicate confirm which stop of the pair is referred to. Indicator is vital. Really important for detailed differentiation of stops, but I calculated. Thank you, Dave. I know this is you. Uh, so many thousand different indicators in NAPTAN, it's hard and possible to automatically augment stop names with it in a consistent, reliable way. Reference of common name in relationship to main road or flag indicator, stop A, etc. Right. I kind of get indicator. Now I'm about to hit localities. I'm going to group all the localities together because we know that grandparents are very rarely used. Parent localities are sometimes used and locality is, a, is has to be used. But just because it has to be used doesn't mean that it's useful. So when NubTig created other gazetteers were not freely available, also useful to have to know definitive name for an area to help with consistency between information products. Localities, i.e. is essential as it underpins all stops and used more than any other gazetteer other than postcode for journey planning. If you are many miles away, your journey plan to the grandparent if it's closer to the parent and when you travel locally, you use the locality. Localities have to exist in a national gazetteer, but sometimes the name not included is well known. Best use for town and villages to identify. I'm just zooming in to read this one. Lo locally. Locality name for a larger town that has a number of of named estates. Parent and locality, parent locality and town the same. Locality that is a nubtig needs to have some flexibility with significant house building taking place. New developments on the edge of a town are sometimes actually in a neighboring parish. However, from the public's perception are at a bus stop in the town. Occasionally use. We often want to use attractions rather than local area name. Locality and suburb the same. Localities can be vaguely defined and not relevant to actual location. Uh, under grandparent, useful in the context where a stop is on a coach, for example. If a stop is in a suburb or city, then can say Stocksbridge, Sheffield, without having to look it up in Nubtig. And then a lot of don't don't use, never use. Any other quick thoughts on location before I move on to town and suburb? Town, don't use. Only use this if the locality is in a state in a major town. Don't use, don't use, don't use. Very subjective. Only use in towns, otherwise, use town field for villages. Right. Um, that kind of helps me understand some of how, some of what's in those fields and helps me put it together a little bit more and will hopefully help us understand more about how these fields are, are actually used. And like I said, try and come back with something that's a little bit more slowly gentle rather than whack a mole -ing. So let's move on. I, and my apologies to the perf person from Bucks who's who's here. I've chosen two stops um, simply because they are outside of London. I could physically get to them. Um, they are on the border, so they're they're between two 
they're on the same route, but they're from two different local authorities. And I wanted to run through a working example of a problem and just try and get people to kind of say, we would do this or we would do that, or this doesn't seem right or something like this. So what I've tried to do is I've put fields down in yellow, and then I've put stop one and stop two um, down there. And then I've listed out the fields in that 10 and one is in bucks and one is in hearts. And what I'm also trying to do is figure out how some of these sites have put stuff together. So what fields they might have used to build up this particular name. Um, so just to run through the stops, I've got a physical picture of each stop. There is, uh, they're, they're on the route. Um, it's this stop here and this stop here, I think, even though these don't quite map on the road. Um, that's another problem that I'll get to in the next meeting is mapping. Um, so stop one is here, uh, but it's actually here. Uh, and stop two is here, uh, which is on the side of this main A road, which I stopped off at. So if this one is a little bit more rural um, because it's between towns. This one, I'm not sure whether it's a town, village or suburban, and it's in a place called Ashley Green, if anyone ever wants to go visit Ashley Green. So what I've got is we have ACTO codes and NAPTIN codes. These are unique stops. Google Maps lists them as St John's Church and Hockeridge Wood. Apple Maps lists them as St John's Church stop and Hockeridge Wood stop. So all Apple Maps has done is put the word stop at the end of something. The Buckinghamshire Journey Planner lists them as Ashley Green St John's Church, and it doesn't list the second stop because it's seen as a minor stop. The Red Eagle, which is the bus operator's site, lists them as Ashley Green opposite St St John's Church and Hare's Foot near, near Hockeridge Wood. The Hertfordshire Journey Planner lists them as Ashley Green, Ashley Green Road Church and Hare's Foot, Chesham Road opposite Hockeridge Wood. The Bus Operator's Timetable, they had multiple timetables, listed as Ashley Green, Ashley Green Road Church and Hare's Foot, Chesham Road opposite Hockeridge Wood. Bods lists them as St John's Church and Hockeridge Wood. Eto World listed pretty much everything. Ashley Green adjacent St John's Church on Ashley Green Road SMS, and here's Foot near Hockridge Wood on Chesham Road and its SMS. And the bus stop checker listed as John St John's Church in Hockridge Wood. And NAPTAN, we end up with some quite different things. So we ended up with St John's Church, St John's Church, Two Dows Lane, which feels like the wrong landmark perhaps. The street is Ashley Green Road. The locality name is Ashley Ash. Green and the indicator is adjacent. Hockridge Wood, unknown, Chesham Road, opposite William Hill Farm, Hare's Foot, and Nair. These, this is a lot of name for these stops, and I'm trying to understand which bits are working and which bits are not quite working. Um, what I'd like you to do is take a minute or two and just throw up there where you think this has gone wrong, where some of these names have come from, and what is some of the conventions that we're missing here? Um, and also, is this a town, is stop one a town suburban and stop two a rural, or are they both suburban? Stop two is um, literally between the Ashley Green stop, there's this stop, and then there's a school stop, and then it goes on to uh, a slightly more populated area. So it's kind of between two populations. So I want to give you like five minutes um, to just kind of put any thoughts up on this as to where things are going wrong, not to point fingers at Buckingham, at Bucks or Hearts. This is the data that's there and just trying to understand what conventions we might be running into and what conventions we might have done slightly different between the two adjacent local authorities that have kind of created some of this uncertainty about how we would even programmatically pull out some of this name. Does that make sense to everybody? I can see people writing already. I, I heartily approve. Um, as for the mapping thing, that's the next public meeting, I believe, is mm, putting putting things on a map. 
um, as you can see, things don't quite line up with maps. And that's the next problem that we're going to kind of talk through and try and understand. Um, and I'm, that is in a couple of days, that is next week, I believe. Just wanted to give you a heads up on that. OK, so that's time. So what I'm going to do is just read through everyone's comments. And um, again, please put your hand up and, and read out any thoughts. Um, also, again, for anyone from Bucks or Hearts watching or listening or being part of this, this isn't pointing fingers at you and saying that you've done something wrong. We're literally trying to understand how these things are combined in different ways. And these were examples that I could get my hands on. Um, so starting from the top, uh, starting over here, Google have historically not updated their stop data very often and are possibly only re removing deleted stops twice a year. Um, I believe from being told that Google get the information from Eto World. Uh, can somebody confirm that to me or drop me a line and just confirm how Google, where Google get their feed from? Because it would be really good just to make sure that we that we had that well and truly mapped out. Um, this highlights the need for education of data users, and I put a nice green star of yes, it does. Google and Apple show only show stops that have an active service against them. So I take it. Oh, Peter. Yes, yeah, so just if you wanted a little on, on that, yeah, it's, it's, it's correct that they. Uh, Google, um, it's the base map that don't, doesn't get very updated very often, um, but in fact the uh, they do get sent the Naptan data every day um, with the very latest. Um, so you need to distinguish um, between journey planning um, and uh, using the very latest data uh, being laid on top of a map uh, that um, has a, a rather more uh, slower update uh, cycle. Um, I think just while just while we're on that, just to to explain that it's Google's preference um, only to take common name, and um, we do um, um, we are aware that the effect. You can look at some long bus to, uh, bus routes in Scotland that go from um, the, uh, the 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 village to the the uh, the um, the public toilets to the uh, you know what the telephone box and all the common names that are 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 not named uh, with the locality, which would be the right way to do it, of course. Yeah, and I think that's maybe some education for the data user. I hate to say that we need to educate Google on how to use this data, but I think this is some of this points back to that one that I put the little green star on. There is some education that needs to be made to the data users about how these are used and that's something that i think i want to see built into the new naptan site so people can understand people who are wanting to start to use naptan data to do sensible things with can understand what the data actually means in a very simplified fashion so they can go oh this is what a common name is all about and I know you can get that from the schema documentation. It might, it, a lot of people don't appear to make a lot of use of that. Uh, where are we? Google, Google, Google highlights, right? Some services, some mapping services just download Naptan data themselves or via OpenStreetMap. Uh, no stop name on flag. Um, that seems to be the convention in. Buckinghamshire at the moment, um, and if anyone can let me know about that, that would be really great. Um, not listed. I wondered what causes this choice. Um, by the way, this bus stop, this bus runs. It's a, it's almost. It seems to be predominantly a school bus route, um, and it runs a couple of times in the morning, three or four times around about eight thirty to nine o'clock. Then it runs maybe once every 90 minutes for the rest of the day. It runs a lot of uh, about quite frequently between 3 and 4.30 and then stops. So it is a very, very school based um, bus route. Uh, referring to a stop locality common name as per the Bucks journey planner seems to make sense from a passenger perspective. The commas help to define each part of the name. Red Eagle site is the clearest for the customer. 
by the way, we're not allowed to use commas in our names because it, it causes a glitch in the um, schema. Um, so I've just had to raise to a couple of people where they've accidentally put a comma rather than a slash or any of the other indicators in. Um, that could be a lot of information for a member of the public to take in. Simplicity may be key in this instance, as journey planners will tell the public which stop is closest to the origin or destination stop. Op, adjacent, etc. may be too much as a user may not know which stop that is. Journey planners such as travel line and passenger powered websites would tell a passenger exactly where a stop is on a map. We'll, and that's why I said we'll get to mapping uh, in the next meeting. Um, commas help. That are be much stricter in the indicator values that can be submitted, e.g. there are hundreds of different ways of expressing opposite. Dave, thank you very much for this. Yeah, predictably um, me. Thank you, Dr. J. <laughs> I, I know I can feel the thing that is causing you the most pain right now, and I do understand, and I think this is something that we could start to look at. Um, why is the distinction between rural and suburban? Isn't it just a bus stop? What I wanted to understand in doing this distinction is just um, when we've talked, we talked about the different constraints of the different types of bus stops, and I wanted to just get your yours opinions of whether these stops, were, when you were talking about them, whether they would be considered urban or rural or suburban. So I just kind of wanted to get your point of view on what these bus stops were about. Um, I wonder what the cluster of names, cluster of buildings nearest the stop is called. Um, I can't tell because there's no road signs there. Um, I've hopped I've hopped out on my car on this 60 mile an hour little two lane piece of muddy highway, um, stood on the one accessible piece of, of ground because it is a nice accessible bus stop that goes off into nothing, uh, that goes off into the wood. Um, and there's a little lane and a few houses, but there's no names. I can't tell anywhere what these buildings are called. There's no building names or anything useful like that. Um, a wood is an interesting choice of point of interest as it could be very large and not seem to be very specific. The wood actually fills the distance between the edge of Ashley Green and the stop and a little bit and about a uh, half a mile further on. So the wood is quite a large point of interest. Um, and obviously there are some walking trails there somewhere. Uh, different Differing expectations for the local user. The name used by Google Maps may be sufficient, but for a less local user, the full descriptor used by Ito is more relevant to guide them. There isn't a good solution which doesn't appear either too abbreviated or overly wordy. Um, these are similar to how the schema suggests should be used as travel line journey planner used, locality, main road, indicator, common name, or some form depending on what indicator is used. The problem that I have with this one is here, it just gives me Ashley Green Road Church, but it doesn't tell me which of the two churches it is. I think there's two churches in that town. So there's a weird, this is a weird little struggle for the advanced player of this game of which of the two churches could this be pointing to um, is a little bit tricky to tell, especially when the crossing road refers to two Dells Lane, which is down here, when actually Hogs Lane is the next one on the left. So there's a, there's weird little conventions that we've talked about that aren't used here. And I'm just needing to kind of unpick where they might be. And, and is that the right convention? Is there a convention that's been used here because nobody knows Hog Lane, everyone knows two Dell Lane? because Tudale Lane is the most important road in the Ashley Green Village. Um, really poor to have so much information in the field. Uh, and I think, oh no, yep, I think that's covered everything. Is there anything that we've missed here? Is there anything that anyone thinks there's a easy, simple, better way to get these names together? Is there a simple, is there a magic wand that I can wave to make these work? We've run out of magic wands. Dave, 
Dave, you've got a magic wand for me then. No, I haven't. I think I, I think there's two ways, really. I, I kind of expressed it before. I mean, I've, I've been a bit pedantic and given the exact numbers, but it's really just to show that it is, it's, it, it's not really possible to put them all to account for all those different indicators, but it feels like the indicator is the key thing in putting this name together. Like sometimes you're going to say this thing is opposite something. It's like a, rela a relative or relation type, you know, this stop opposite the museum. Sometimes these indicators are kind of, um, directional types, this stops westbound, northbound, whatever. And sometimes they're kind of just hyper local differentiators, like this is stop A, you know, you're in the right, you're at Bank Station, and this is stop A at Bank Station. And I think for some of those types, we could account for them much better and all make much better um, names and have common business logic if they were really restricted the number of values you could have for that. So you could only, there were only a certain number of relative to a landmark types of values you could have so you could have opposite adjacent outside i don't mind how what they were but there'd only be one way of expressing opposite or adjacent and not you know a few hundred um and if it came down to that then i think we'd all get the business logic together to be able to say to be able to come up with the same name again and again which is what the end user wants to see so i think that's one way of doing it um and might be the quickest fix without breaking anything would be my suggestion um hmm. I, I think the other way would be to give data data producers complete control of lots of different names to be used in lots of different contexts. Because the data producers do know, and they're very, very good at it. Um, it's just making sure that the names are recreated as they intended them to look. So I like that data producers, producers make names the way they intended to look so i think that's a that's a really good point dave because that is one of the things that i'm finding um for example even here ed i'll come to you edmund i'll come to you in two seconds um even here the indicators adjacent and near actually aren't the indicators that are used in the naming fields and aren't the indicators that are used here because it's not it's used opposite william hill farm but they're using near for something else. So there's all these weird little rules and maybe it's there's ways of showing the data producers how those names that they've put together will look in different circumstances so they can adjust it to make it look right themselves so that they know how users will use, how users refer to this place. Um, Edmund. Yeah, so, so, sorry if I'm sort of misunderstanding um, your, your point about the Hogs Lane and, and Two Dells Lane, but I think the comment that I would have is that the stops, both of the stops that you can see on the screen there, um, the, the northbound stop, the next junction on the left is Hogs Lane, and the southbound stop, the next junction on the left is Two Dells Lane, but you really only want to use one name for both sides of the road because if you're a passenger going to that stop and then returning from that stop, you want you want it to have a common, you know, consistency that that location is one place. So you don't want you don't want to be using sort of two different road names for different sides of the road. Thank you, Edmund. That was the bit that I'd missed because when we said, and thank you for clarifying, because when we said it's the stop on the left. I took it to be the stop on the left from the stop that I'm standing outside, which is this one at Hogs, just before Hogs Lane. And then this one across the road is just by Two Dells Lane. So that's the first stop on the left. But you make a really good point that they both need to be named after the same crossing point so that yeah. I know that they're opposite each other. Yes, you, you need to pick one of those roads. Using both, I think, would be sort of kind of more confusing. Yes, you, you, yes. You, you need to sort of pick one and stick with it. Yes, I totally get that, and I totally understand. Um, the post box also is in the wrong place, but let's not even touch Google Maps on that one. They've managed to put the post box across the road when it's actually on the same side as the other bus stop. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left. What I wanted to do, what I forgot to do was put in the next meeting list. What I wanted to do was just talk about where we're at and give you an update on where we're at with creating new NAPTAN. Um, so that you can all understand where we're going, where we're going to ask for more people to come on board, um, and we can really make some differences. So release one, 
which is being able to download data from NAPTAN, has been completed, and that's what we've got in private beta at the moment. Now that we've got you, everyone who's uploading data is still using the old upload mechanism. Before it gets processed or anything, it goes into a folder in current NAPTAN. And what we're doing is we're copying it, copying that data down to our system and processing it ourselves. And we have a slightly different way of processing the data. So we've taken the decision that we will not change any data that anyone gives us. So if data is missing, we're not going to put stuff in. We're not going to convert fields. We're not going to summarize fields. We're not going to change fields. So this has changed a little bit of the data that's produced. So we've currently got um, a national CSV file for stops only and a CSV file for stops only for a single local authority. So those, those are the two things that you can now get from our site, um, from the from the private beta, and we're working to do some more variations on that. So we're going to get like multiple local authorities. We're going to get the XML um, also available as well. So that's we're taking in the data and we're producing it. Um, what we're also looking at doing is looking back. We've split out the feedback we can give to you and the ability to upload a file. So because we are able to process the data and we're able to do it within about, generally within about 10 minutes um, of you uploading the data to the systems, we can get feedback within 10 minutes. If something fails, we're currently working out some feedback loops. So we want to say, for example, um, somebody's accidentally put some commas in we discover that we send you an e we send the person an email and say hi by the way at the stop number you've put some commas in here's here's a bit of detail about it let us know when um please correct this when you next upload because your file's not going to validate so we're able to give people feedback a lot faster so we're looking at how we can automate that how we can make that a lot more routine how we can make that happen Auto magically, the system just goes and sends you an email. It's not having to go through me sitting there trying to figure out what to write. Um, we're also talking about what's we've got some identity and authentication going. We're now trying to figure out with this feedback loop as to whether we could start to bring in a couple of business rules, which is what I'm trying to look at here and trying to understand if there's any decent business rules we could start to apply. Um, and then the next piece of work we're going to do after that is do we've got some things that we know don't need a schema change. So we've got some data quality, creating an API, switching off the old site. We can't do that until a whole pile of stuff has happened. Um, doing some mapping of the stops. So I know that Eto World currently has a visualization of each stop. We're looking at at some point how we could do something like that and when we fit that work in around doing the other pieces. We need to do some work with NubTig. We need to bring that across at least so we can turn off the old site. Um, and I've put their fixed data in the 9X series. We know that the data in the 9X series has some issues. It could be better. Um, and also it's being centrally managed by DFT to solve a technical problem with the old system. So we want to look at how we could change that. Does this data actually have to be managed by DFT? Or for example, Transport for London is building the Elizabeth, well, is building building some of the stops on the Elizabeth line. It knows where those stops are. It knows what their accessibility is like. It knows where those entrances and exits are. It knows how many platforms there are there. Why? can't they go and edit that? Why do they have to send us the information for us to go and put it in? So that's some of the stuff that I'm also looking at. Um, and then there's some stuff around, we might need a schema change to unlock. We're going, we're working through some of that and having a look at what will bring in the biggest value. What are the things that we can do that will bring in the biggest value and move us as close as possible to this holistic vision of the world? Um, with increased public transport usage. So we believe that by putting all of this effort in to NAPTAN and to BODS 
and to real-time bus information and to all of these pieces will make more people want to use public transport. That's what that's what our goal is, and that's what we're all aiming for. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. So that's. Does anyone have any thoughts or comments, or does this worry you in any way? Is this making you happy? Everyone's just bewildered. Um, so very quickly, just in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you to have a think about what we've done today. What was good and useful? What gave you joy? What frustrated you? What was not good? What, 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 what wasn't useful? And what made you sad? What things are missing? What should be happening? So I'd really love you to give us feedback because we iterate and we change these based on that feedback. And while you're doing that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute, find the comms plan, and then come back to you and give you the comms. I'll add to this um, mural the comms of what's going to happen over the next um, couple of weeks, next couple of months, while you fill that out. Let me just share my screen. Um, so here is the... Thank you, teams, for hiding the thing that I just wanted to share. Here is the team that we uh, the the. Here is the comms plan. Um, so in June we we sent out our June newsletter incredibly late, start of July, but it, we managed to send it out. Um, we got into archived and deleted. We know that there's going to have to be a second discussion about that. And some of the weird points that came up in there um, was about because we're no longer um, sanitizing data, we're no longer changing any data that anyone gives us. Um, when things are coming in from schemas greater than 2.1, that's got some differences. So we kind of want to play around with that. I'll be sending out another comms email. If you want to be on the receiving end of those, just let me know. Um, this is the one that we had. Let's talk names. The next one is all about mapping. So how do we tell where a stop should be? How do we tell when a stop locks to a road, whether it's locked to the right road? Um, how precise do we need to be about a stop currently? Um, is there a precision that we're going to need when we move to slightly more automated vehicles? And are some people already moving to that precision? Um, and then in August, Tim and I are trying to do calendars and dates. Um, we've got a bit on migration planning. So I want to start talking about how we're going to move from current NAPTAN to new NAPTAN and open it up. We want to have a talk about school bus stops. We don't want to, but we need to because um, there's a lot of bus stops currently called school stop um, within a whole pile of the data, which makes it hard to disambiguate them, but also hard for people to plan around them. And we'll also run archived and deleted equals unwanted part two. Um, so if there's anything anyone else wants to see from, from those public meetings, please email me and let me know. And if you want my email address, the email address is, is up here. Um, so that's my contact details and that's Adrian's contact details, who's the product owner who couldn't make today. Um, and we've stopped exactly at two hours. We've covered pretty much everything apart from constraints, but I think in the discussion around context, we got a lot of ideas around the different ways that we're having to use things. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, your participation and all of that in these meetings is so important to us starting to really get this, this stuff right and starting to move forward. So I really, really appreciate it. And I, while we finish off, I will just read through some of these and see if there's any questions. Naming a bus stop, regardless of the naming convention, is hard. Oh, it makes me so sad. I think we needed to add another context earlier in the mural. The user is standing at the stop looking at the bus stop flag. The RTPI real time something display and or their phone. Is this information consistent? There is no magic wand. There is a hard problem to solve. Um, what frustrated us would be good to understand how each area uses the fields. I'm sure we all believe our way is best, but I could be better persuaded that a change is a good thing and what that change would be if I had a clue how others already use rather than trying to create a new version from a standing start. I totally agree and I'm 
trying to get a sense of how people use it. Um, and I'm going to be doing, like Dave, um, a lot of analysis of what's out there just to try and pull some of this apart and present some of this back. It's a big group, difficult to hear all views. I totally understand, but everyone who is here should be here. And in fact, there should be more people here, but I think it's really good because we've got in a good mix of people. No simple solution as data providers do things differently as do data users. Uh, very difficult to apply simple rules to real life. Also need to be aware there's not necessarily one answer. What current frustration is Ito is Fiat, by putting one error right, they can cause another easy locality name. Oh, that, by putting one error right, they can cause another locality name Stockton. Stockton School causes an error as a locality is du duplicated, yet Stockton School is also an error. Yes, yes. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're trying not to just import the business rules as they are, because we know that they're really inconsistent. Um, good to hear we all have the user experience is our main priority, hopefully. Good, we all have similar issues and agree. Good to hear the put points. Good that we're aiming for an improved system. The comment on choosing a common name for both sides of the road is useful as it helps with Google one naming issue. Uh, I'm not sure who is included in the session, but are those who pull the data and display EG journey planners here? I would like them to be. So if there's people you think who should be coming to these but aren't, and I hate to make this sound like subscribe and ring the bell and do all of that stuff. Please tell them about this. Please say we you should be here. Please, we, we send out those lovely emails using the government notify. Forward them on and let people know that they should be coming to these and they're actually interesting. Dave. Uh, yeah, just to say, uh, I think the there's such great knowledge captured in this mirror board. I don't know if it's appropriate, uh, but if you were able to send a PDF out, it'd be amazing to capture to be able to see that and capture it. Um, oh, you missed my comment earlier to Tim. I've got real issues. I've, my boards are now so big. Um, I started off creating boards on a, what would be an A2 or an A1 or an A0 piece of paper. My boards are now so big that most PDF, um, most PDF stuff just refuses to read them because they're they're so ginormous, but what I'm doing is I'm leaving that bit.ly link will always stay active. So I'm not closing down the board or anything like that. I just leave the board up so that people can view it. Brilliant. Sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Oh, no, no. I, I think I only said it when me and Tim was talking because I was explaining why I hadn't sent him PDFs because we went through four different ways of reading the PDF that's created from Mural and it truncates it all the time and I can't find a, a, a decent reader that's not on a Mac. Mac preview will allow me to view it beautifully. Nothing else, nothing else works. Nothing on Windows, nothing else works. So I'm just, um, Mac obviously has decided that people can have absolutely ginormous PDFs. Nobody else has. Um, so that's it. Thank you, everybody. We've run five minutes over now with me muttering my way through here. Um, but again, please go and have a life.